Well, right out of college, I became a youth pastor and I had a blank slate. I was beginning a ministry. I was given a handful of kids, but by the grace of God, uh, the ministry began to grow. And as it did, I suddenly realized I need fellow laborers. I need other people to minister to these kids along with me. And so I started to look for how to do that, recruit. And I had a guy at our church come up to me and say, hey, I've been a Sunday school teacher at other churches for years. I'll come help you. But as a brand new minister, I felt responsibility for my flock. And so I thought, well, you know, I should probably screen who gets to shepherd them. So as a young man, I came up with an application and an interview process. And so I told this guy, that's great, you want to volunteer, uh, fill this out and I'll come meet you at your office. And so I showed up at his office and sure enough walked in there and his office was covered with Christian paraphernalia. There was the Christian fish, ichthus on his desk. I believe if memory serves, Bible verses pinned up against the wall. And I'm like, oh, okay, here's a good sign. But before the interview began, he said, give me one moment, I've got to go talk to my employees because he was the owner of this business. And he walked around the corner into another room and I guess he's not aware of how thin the walls were of his office. Because for the next few moments, I heard him berate and cuss and verbally abuse his employees. And then he came back around into the office for his interview to be a youth minister. And needless to say, that interview was short because I had heard all I needed to hear about what this man was like. Now, why mention that? For this reason, nobody cares what we preach if they don't see it lived out in practice. Our message is not meaningless. It has intrinsic value, but it will not be seen as beautiful until people see that beauty expressed in a human life. And what's fascinating is we're in this letter today, and here's what's interesting. We've been in this study of Colossians, uh, Paul writing to this community in Colossae, and you go, well, why are we breaking from it if we're in the same series? Well, you'll see in a minute how these are related, but I want to show you, Paul is going to narrow the scope into one human life, into this man Philemon, and say, if this message has landed in your life, it should be displayed through your life. And he's going to convict him to let the gospel manifest itself in his decisions. And my hope is it will convict us to do the same as well. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to move through a book of the Bible together. This is one of the shortest books in your Bible. So I don't know if you knew this. You're going to read a whole book of the Bible today. Congratulations. And as we do, you'll figure out why we're in this letter as we're studying Colossians. But to begin in verse 1, it says, Paul a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker. Now, Paul doesn't normally introduce himself as prisoner, uh, but he says later in the book that he doesn't want to use his authority to coerce Philemon to act, which is probably why he didn't introduce himself as apostle. He said, I'm a prisoner of Christ because Paul at this time was in prison for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Timothy was there too, who likely knew Philemon because Timothy was with Paul as they ministered in Ephesus in neighboring Colossae. And that's where Philemon lived. And so he mentions him, but then he calls Philemon, I don't know if you notice this, our beloved fellow worker. And those are titles that Paul reserved for someone in the Christian community. You are the beloved. We are both loved by God, and so therefore we love each other. And then not only does he call him the beloved, we're part of the family of Jesus. He says you're a fellow worker. That means you're not just someone who's in the community of faith. You've actually put your shoulder to the work. You've put your hand on the plow and you have helped expand the gospel, whether personally telling people about Jesus or financially funding the ministry. He looks at Philemon and says, you've got skin in the game and we've seen it. You're a part of this with us. And then he gives a shout out to his family, presumably to Aphia, our sister, most commentators think that's probably his wife, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. Archippus there is interesting. That that title, fellow soldier, Paul reserves for those who, who were preaching the gospel alongside him and took the hits sometimes that came when you preached Jesus. And he says, Archippus is a guy that's been a part of the work with me and part of the suffering with me. Paul's presenting himself and Archippus, who many commentators guess is Philemon's son, as those who understood that proclaiming Christ means you might take some hits of persecution. But Paul had made that choice. 
The other interesting thing about Archippus is he's mentioned at the back of Colossians in kind of a fascinating verse. As Paul is wrapping up his letter to the Colossians, he had read over this community, say to Archippus, see that you fulfill the ministry you've received in the Lord. Dang, can you imagine being Archippus? A letter arrives to the entire church and at the end of it, it's like, hey, everybody, tell Bill there to get it done, what God told him to do. You'd be like, oh, right? A little bit of pressure on Archippus. But what it shows you is he's mentioned at the end of the book of Colossians. And so are also all these guys at the end of Philemon in the shout out section, Mark and Aristarchus and Demas. And so what you find out by seeing their name is that this letter of Philemon is written to the same people that are in Colossae. And then when you look at how Paul ends his greeting, he says, an Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. So now we understand what's happening here. Whether all or part, the Colossian church met in Philemon's house, which means one, Philemon was paid, right? You gotta have money to have a house that can house a church, right? But it's also showing you that when this letter from Paul arrived at Colossae, the cover letter stapled to it was this letter to Philemon. That Paul has written this letter about reconciliation to God and reconciliation to one another. And now Paul is going to put on display and we need to see it in Philemon's life. And so here Paul writes specifically to the man leading this house and gives him the greeting of grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. And then he thanks God for him, which was common for Paul. This is a short thanksgiving. But he says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. He thanks God for him sincerely because he says, I've seen your faith in the Lord Jesus become love for Jesus and for other people, which incidentally is what Christianity is about. That a redemption inside leads to reconciliation outside that when God works on my heart from within, I take on the work that pleases God's heart on the outside. This is the Christian life. Paul told the Galatians, nothing matters except faith working itself out through love. How do you know you have the real disease? We see the symptoms. That if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, that he loved you and died for you, that love does not stay within, it expands out towards others. And Paul says, I've seen the evidence you're truly converted, that your faith in Jesus has become love for the saints. And then in verse six, he says, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. That sharing of your faith, that word sharing is the word koinonia. It can, it can mean fellowship, community. Here it carries the idea of your generosity to the community. So he doesn't mean sharing faith here like evangelism, which is how you hear a lot of people say it, sharing Christ with other people, though that's important, and we'll talk about that in two weeks. What he's saying here is your faith has prompted you to materially bless other believers. Grace became generosity. And the sharing of your faith to saints has refreshed them. It's been a good thing. But then Paul says, but I'm praying that the full knowledge, the epinosis, the full implications of that generosity will be made known. What he's saying to Philemon is, hey, I'm seeing good in your life. Jesus touched in your life and I'm beginning to see good things. You're doing good work, but I want to push you way further. And what you see is right here at the beginning as Paul's complimenting him sincerely, he's also setting him up for the big ask. And he tells him, I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. He says, I've watched you legitimately care for other believers. And let me just tell you something. It comforts my heart and thrills my heart. And can I just say, as a parent I see that with my kids. When I see them love each other, I delight. I want to see you take care of each other and love each other. And as a pastor, can I say, I love it when I see y'all care for each other and love one another. It thrills my heart. And so Paul sincerely tells him, what you're doing is good. Then we get verse eight. Accordingly, 
Though I'm bold enough in Christ to command you to do what's required. All right, let's stop right there. Because things just got awkward. Paul's telling him, I see your sincere faith and I see it's doing some real good in the world. And then he goes, but to be clear, I'm not afraid to tell you what to do. Okay. Paul assumes in that I have the authority to tell you what to do. I'm not scared to tell you what to do. And what I'm about to ask you to do, notice he says you're required to do, that under God, there's activities you are meant to take part of and I wanna push you to them. And yet notice that he says, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what's required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I want you to notice what Paul's doing there because it's significant because this is the Christian life. Why do we love one another and give to one another and serve each other and forgive each other? It is not because of external compulsion, but internal conviction. Paul says, I don't want you to get some commands from God that you must do this and you must do that. No, I want it to rise up from within. I don't want forced compliance. I want willing compassion. This is the Christian life. We are not people who follow list of rules to make sure the deity's not mad at us. We are people who have been changed on the inside and that changes things on the outside. That a renovated heart leads to a reconciling life. Do you see it? This is important. So when Paul looks at him, he says, hey, there's some things I need you to do you're not doing. And I could tell you to do it, but I don't want to argue that way. For love's sake, I want to appeal to you. I don't want you to be forced. I want you to choose it. Again, it's like me with my kids. I can tell them to stop screaming and hitting each other, but I want them to want to not scream and hit each other. I can tell them to love each other, but I want them to want to love each other. And here he says, in Christ, you've been given a new heart. I want to see the love of it radiate out. So I'm asking you. And then Paul says, I Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner for Christ Jesus. Why does he throw that in? He makes it personal. I, Paul. You know, he said hi to his family, but all the pronouns now are singular. Paul's like, Philemon, I'm looking you dead in the eye, and it's me talking to you, and I'm an old man. It's the word presbyteros, where you get presbytery. It, it, it carries the idea of authority, because old men had authority. It could carry the idea of emissary. So, so maybe he is keying into, I've got some wisdom and some years on you. But he also says that I'm a, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. I've taken some hits willingly because of my association with Jesus. Now I'm asking you to get uncomfortable too. In verse 10, I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became, in my imprisonment. Now Paul finally brings up why he's writing this. He says, I'm appealing to you out of love for Onesimus. And he calls him my child whose father I became while I was imprisoned. Now, what does that mean? Uh, Paul here is talking about spiritually parenting him. Paul will use this idea in other letters that when you help lead someone to put their faith in Christ, you're like a spiritual parent to them. And he says, I became this man's father while I was in prison. The idea there that Onesimus was either imprisoned next to Paul or came to visit Paul, whether on purpose or accidentally, he wound up in Paul's orbit. Paul told him about the grace of Jesus Christ that can renovate us from the inside out. And Onesimus believed and was born again. And so when he was born again, Paul says, I am appealing to you, Philemon, on behalf of Onesimus because I became his dad while he was in prison. But now you see the subject of the letter. It's deeply personal. Paul is saying to Philemon, I'm appealing to you on behalf of this man. And you see in the next verse, this parenthetical comment about him in verse 11. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. So Paul is intimating there, there's been a breach between these two men. There's been a conflict, difficulty and hurt and he's assuming that Philemon feels it acutely. And so he just acknowledges it. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now a change has happened and he's useful both to you 
and to me. And Paul's making a play on words there. Uh, the name Onesimus means useful. And Paul says, formerly you saw him as useless. Now he's useful both to you and to me. And he says in verse 12, I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I am sending to you someone I care about deeply. And again, Paul is going to push Philemon to make a decision here, but he's doing it. He's pushing him to make the right decision for the right reason. And we'll find out what it is in a minute. If you look at verse 13, he says, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. Paul said, I would rather have him here to, to diakonos, to, to be someone who's helping alongside of me. That could mean physically keep you alive because when Paul was in a Roman prison, the, the state didn't pay to feed you. Your friends had to feed you. So maybe it was to keep him alive. Or maybe as you see in Paul's imprisonment, he's constantly sending letters and evangelism all around the world. The idea is he said, hey, Onesimus been working alongside of me. I would rather have been here. And he says, been here to serve on your behalf. The assumption being, I know you would rather be here to serve me, but since you can't, I'd rather keep him here on your behalf while I'm in prison. But then he moves on. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness not, might not be from compulsion, but of your own accord. I'm about to ask you to do something with this man. And I want the choice to rise out of inner conviction, not outer compulsion. Now, here's a moment I want to read to you. This is from back in Colossians at the end. Paul signs off Colossians where he says, Tychicus will tell you about my activities. He's a beloved brother, faithful minister, fellow servant. I've sent him for this very purpose that you may know how we are, that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will tell you everything that's taken place here. What you see here is Paul had writ written this letter to the Colossians about reconciliation with God that's created reconciliation throughout humanity. There is now no longer Jew, Greek, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is in all and is all. And Paul's preached that beautiful message of reconciliation across boundaries because of the grace of Jesus. And then Paul sends that letter in the hand of Onesimus, who's had a serious breach with Philemon. And as Paul's preaching this gospel of grace, Paul has this letter, and incidentally, he has the letter Philemon, the last grace be with you is plural. This letter was meant to be read in front of everybody. That here is Paul's preaching about reconciliation. It's not just a pie in the sky thing you say at church, but not how it plays out on the streets. Paul puts exhibit A in front of the whole church. If this message works in here, it's gotta work in there. It's got to work in your relationships. And so he puts Onesimus and Philemon in the same room and says, we need to see reconciliation play out right here. And you go, well, what's the breach? You're about to find out in the next verse. Verse 15, he says, for this perhaps is why he was parted for you, from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. Uh, talking about spiritually there. Verse 16, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now we get the full picture of what's going on. Onesimus was a bond servant to Philemon. And Onesimus left. He was in Paul, with Paul in prison. And however that played out, it was a breach of relationship with Philemon and Onesimus. And now Paul is sending him back. Because he had to? No. Neither Jewish law nor Roman law said you had to send a bondservant back. Paul did it not to obey any law, but to promote a reconciliation. I'm sending him back to you, but I'm not returning to you a servant. I'm sending you a beloved brother. Things change here, right? Now, as soon as I bring that up, now we got to talk about a serious issue, and that is slavery in the Bible, all right? Uh, because, and you go, why are we doing this book now? Well, the very next passage in Colossians, it talks about slaves and masters. And so I didn't want to just blow past that or just act like it was fine. We got to talk about slavery in the Bible. Now, this isn't a whole sermon on it, but I want to give us about five minutes class on how slavery works out in the Bible. Because some of you have probably encountered what I watched one time a video 
video of a man do with a high school room of journalism majors. He was asked to speak to high school journalism majors, and he used his platform to excoriate the Bible because it got slavery wrong. And how do you answer to a criticism like that? Well, let's talk a little bit about slavery in the Bible because it was different in Paul's day than it was in the 18th and 19th century in the transatlantic slave trade. Now, as soon as I say that, let me make clear, what I'm about to do is in no way a defense of ancient slavery. It's an explanation, all right? Uh, so I'm not advocating it. I'm just explaining it, class. We got it? All right. Slavery was ubiquitous across human cultures. You see it in all different nations across continents all around the world. What's interesting is as you study history, you see slavery manifest in all these different cultures, all these different nations throughout centuries. You never see an abolitionist movement to abolish slavery because it's wrong. You see people who don't wanna be slaves and, and form an insurrection, but you don't see people rising up and saying this institution is wrong and should be dissolved until the people of Jesus. So let me just say from the beginning, the seeds of the revolution against slavery are right here in this text and in our Bibles. Abolitionist movement is a deeply Christian one and secular and Christian historians will tell you that. But as you look at the Bible and say, how did slavery work throughout history? There were different kinds. In Egypt, you see in the Old Testament, Egypt, it was perpetrated, race-based, compulsive, endless, and harsh, right? That was the slavery that the uh, Israelites were in under Egypt and God hated it and God set them free. And then as God set free the nation of Israel, you see in the Old Testament, God is forming his nation and you see as he does it, slavery there is in some ways regulated, regulated in that time. And here's what I mean by that. Kidnapping, God will tell them is evil. He says, that's what was done to you. And that's not allowed. You get verses like Exodus 21. Whoever steals a man and sells him, if anyone's found in possession of him, shall be put to death. So the slavery you saw in Egypt and the slavery you see in the transatlantic slave trade, the book of Exodus says that is evil and deserves the death penalty. So some of you hear that and you go, well then how did people in the name of Jesus perpetrate slavery in the 18th and 19th century? Well, they cut verses like this out. Literally, physically, if you go to the Museum of the Bible and look at the Slave Bible, they just removed these passages. How many of you know that it's possible for someone to claim the name of Jesus and to ignore the Bible passages that they find inconvenient? It happens all the time. And it's pretty dark when it does. And this is one of the worst and most egregious ways it could happen. And yet you look in the Old Testament, I won't un cover all of it, but in the Old Testament, there's different ways to regulate a practice that the Bible doesn't endorse in the same way the Bible doesn't endorse slavery, uh, excuse me, divorce. God says in the Old Testament, I hate divorce. And yet as he saw that men would abandon their wives, God created laws and stipulations that you can't cast off the vulnerable to be hurt. And so God created laws to care for those who'd be most vulnerable, usually women and children. And it's the same with slavery. God says, hey, we're putting laws around this that you would respect these people as human beings. These are other human beings. And if you mistreat them, you have to deal with me. And so there were laws for prisoners of war or criminals that were held in uh, forced labor. And then there was, and we won't get into all of it, but this version of uh, uh, servitude that was popular in the Old Testament that was... You could call slavery, but as soon as you say that word, you start to think 18th and 19th century. This was something very different. It was meant by God in the midst of a sinful world to be protection actually for the most vulnerable. It was if you were suddenly without food, destitute, your family was in trouble, you could sell yourself to a person that was uh, wealthy, had property, land, and it was a way to get security. Uh, in the Bible, and you see even in Jesus' parables, the most vulnerable person was not the person who was held as a slave. The most vulnerable person was the day laborer, that they woke up every day not sure if they would get any food. And so uh, if they got sick or they got hurt, you were on your own. And so many of them would sell themselves to a wealthy landowner that says, I'll work for you in exchange for money to pay off an existing debt I have or for the security of knowing I've got food and shelter and medical care for my family. Right? 
And so they would do that. And yet the Old Testament regulates it in verses like Leviticus 25. If your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be as a hired worker and as a sojourner. He shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. That was every seventh year you had to set him free. Then he shall go out, he and his children with him, and go back to his own clan and return to the possession of his fathers. And so, again, very different than the transatlantic slave trade. It was uh, a momentary process, not not a a lifelong uh, institution. It was, if I'm in financial jeopardy, I can come into your household and you'll care for me. And then at the end of six or seven years or until the debt paid off, I go free. More to say about it, but we won't get into the Old Testament anymore. By the time you get to the New Testament, centuries later, the nation of Rome had what many historians call like a, a, a slave uh, economy. Very different than, than ancient Israel and even other cultures like Mesopotamia. In Rome, almost a third of the population were considered slaves. And yet it was very different, again, from 18th and 19th century. That's why the ESV used the term bond servant. It's not them trying to sneak around a scary word like slavery. It's trying to help us see it was a little bit different. Again, not defending, I'm explaining, to be clear, class. We still with me? All right. So how did this happen? Well, back then, race was not a factor, and it was meant to be a temporary situation, right? How did one enter into slavery? There were roughly five ways. Number one is you could be kidnapped, which was, again, what happened in ancient Egypt, what happened in the transatlantic slave trade, less of an issue in Rome because Rome really cracked down on piracy. It still happened, uh, but less so. Number two was a prisoner of war or a war criminal or someone who was sentenced uh, to life in prison, had to work and their money went to the state. It's not the same, but it's similar to our criminal system in America. I read an article from NPR last year that talked about the hundreds of millions of dollars put into the U.S. economy by people who work in prisons to make everything from license plates to lingerie, right? Again, I'm not calling them slaves. I'm not saying that so-and-so should be incarcerated or so-and-so shouldn't. Careful. I'm just explaining that was a similar system here. If you were a criminal, you were put to work and weren't necessarily paid. You could be born to a slave woman, You could be in debt bondage. This happened a lot where you ran up a debt you couldn't pay, so you had to work off your debt to that person. But the most common and most unique in Rome was the idea of self-selling or selling a family member into slavery. And people did it really for two reasons. One, for safety. Uh, They could do it, like I mentioned earlier, to get clothing, food, shelter if you didn't have it. Or in Rome, what was unique is many people did it for their personal advantage because it was the fastest way to... Uh, integrate into the society. So it was a process of social integration, not a permanent situation. You would negotiate the terms and the expectation was you would be free by the age of 30. So many of them did it because uh, slave labor wasn't the lowest of labor. Slaves were encouraged to be educated, bond servants. So you would step into this thing. uh, I'll agree to this situation where I can get into a place where I can be educated, I can be taught, and then I can get into the access of kind of a higher echelon of people, receive some education, and then have the access to certain jobs, often within the government. You've got people in the Bible, like Erasmus, who became a city treasurer, most likely from becoming a slave. I'll go work unpaid for a family. And then the idea was, I'm released by age 30. And what became common in Rome is, I was released with Roman citizenship conferred upon me, which was the freedom from having to pay taxes. So there's even stories of the son of a king who sold himself into slavery so he could get out of paying taxes the rest of his life. I'll come work for your family for free and I leave with education and advantage in the culture. That was a common path, sort of like unpaid internships in a sense. But again, I don't wanna sell this. That makes it sound like, oh, it was great. It could be great or it could be horrendous because Rome did allow people to be really mistreated. So that wasn't the idea that Rome had this beautiful system at all. And yet a lot of people entered it because they saw there was safety and there was advantage. That's why it was so ubiquitous in the culture and so different from what we saw in the 18th and 19th century. And the last way you could become a slave back then were baby girls were not seen as as much value. And so baby girls could be left out to die in exposure and men would pick them up and uh, pimp them in brothels or sell them. How does the New Testament respond to that situation? That was the reality the movement of Jesus was born into. How did it respond? To kidnapping 
condemned, both in the Old Testament and in the New. First Timothy 1 uh, talks about how the law is for the unlawful to restrict and to judge them. And amongst the unlawful, it names enslavers, literally man-stealers. The Bible says is wrong. So everything you saw in the 18th and 19th century, the scriptures condemns. Again, then how was it proliferated? We'll talk about that in a second. But it's from people who were ignoring the heartbeat of God expressed through his word. Number two, there was debt slavery. The Bible encourages you over and over again not to do this, not to become a debtor. But what about those who were maybe prisoners of war or criminals or born into slavery? You get a fascinating passage in 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7, uh, Paul is answering the question, what are the social implications of becoming a Christian? What happens when I step into Christ in my social environment? If, what if I'm married to a non-Christian? Do I leave him? What if I'm uncircumcised? Do I get circumcised? Or what if I'm a bondservant? Do I leave in the name of Christ this arrangement because my identity has been so radically changed? And what Paul will say in 1 Corinthians is, no, this movement is not at its essence a political and social movement. So I'm not advocating upheaval in the social strata. So he tells the person who's married to an unbeliever, stay there as long as you can because do it for the sake of the kids and maybe that person will come to Christ. And uh, if they leave you, what are you gonna do? Leave, But, but stay there for the sake of the gospel as long as you can. He says to the uncircumcised, don't get circumcised, that doesn't matter. And then he says to the person who's a bond servant in 1 Corinthians 7, Verse 20 says, each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Don't be concerned about it. Namely, he's saying, Christianity is not going to become a political movement of insurrection. Now, does the gospel have political implications? Yes, we'll talk about it in a second. But Paul is not going to say Christianity is a slave rebellion in ancient Rome. That's not what it became. Now, did Christianity change ancient Rome? Yes, it did. And yet Paul here says, no, stay there. But then he says, but if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself to the opportunity. Slavery then had a big back door. And Paul says, if you're a bond servant, don't in the name of Jesus run away. But if you have that opportunity, avail yourself to it. Get out of that institution. Although it's common in Rome to enter into it, he says, you get out of it. And then he says later, you were bought with a Christ by Christ, but bought with a price by Christ. Do not become bond servants to men. So here he's saying, Christians do not kidnap. We do not get into debt and become servants. And here he says here, do not become bond servants to men. Don't get into debt and don't sell yourself into slavery. That's not what the Christian's going to do. And he says, uh, uh, and if you have any chance to get free, do it. And so what you see in the New Testament is you see an unraveling of the slavery institution. Now, the selling of little baby girls, you don't see in the Bible. What's fascinating, though, is not that much later, in about 300 AD, you get the Cappadocian fathers, the Gregories and Basil, who helped explain a lot of the Trinity to us. They radically cared for the poor, and Gregory of Nyssa said, hey, this whole institution of slavery, it it is cut through with the degradation of human dignity. This whole thing should be abolished. And here you have in the name of Jesus in the 300s AD, Gregory of Nyssa saying slavery is against the heart of God. His hero, their hero was their sister Macrina. And Macrina is the one who said, these little baby girls are being absorbed into the slave culture. The church says no. So what the church did was they would collect these baby girls and raise them. And so you see all through the Christian community, an unraveling of the slavery institution that human beings have dignity in the image of God. And you see an internal renovation is becoming an external reconciliation. And yet Paul does not want, as Christianity is this little institution, to suddenly become a political movement because then all we would do is maybe read about it in a history books as a slave uprising that happened in Rome once long ago. No, Paul says the gospel is an internal renovating of people that leads to an external reconciliation of relationships and of society. It starts in the heart of individuals and then swoops into bigger societal issues. Now, why do I mention that? For this reason. I heard a video the other day. Somebody was asked about justice in the world today and what does faith in Christ have to do with pursuing justice in the world today? And his answer was to talk about two different Jesuses. He said there's liberation theology and then what he called Uh, savior theology. Liberation theology uh, grew up in Latin America, and it was 
popularly an idea uh, back then that Jesus cares much about the poor and the oppressed, which is true. And yet liberation theology uh, back then was, was such a stress upon the political implications of the gospel, and it was within the Catholic Church that the Pope came out and said, hey, we're focusing on orthopraxy, but we've disconnected it from orthodoxy that it's meant to be the renovation of the heart because of Christ that leads to the renovation of society. We're just focusing on society's ills and not getting to people's hearts. It's not an either or, it's a both and. And yet this guy who was speaking, I was listening to him, he said, hey, there's liberation theology. Jesus is a political revolutionary. He says, or then there's savior theology, which is Jesus wants to come and save you from your sins, but you don't do anything in the world. And he kind of mocks this and champions this. Jesus is a political revolutionary that's trying to set people free politically. He's not here to change your heart or forgive your sin. And I would say he is absolutely wrong that Jesus comes to save you from your sin and renovate you from the inside out. And so when Jesus changes your life, you begin to look like Jesus, which is to care deeply for the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, the hurting, that the gospel and its full implications radiates from the inside out. That's what's meant to happen. That's how this is meant to work. And some of us go, well, does it work? Yes. And I've quoted so much in the past because I want to drill this into our mind. Uh, the sociologist Robert Woodbury study from 2012 in the American Political Science Review about the missionary roots of liberal democracy. And he was studying the health of nations around the world. And this is what he discovered. The areas where Protestant missionaries had a significant presence in the past, those nations on average are more economically developed with comparatively better health, lower infant mortality, lower corruption, greater literacy, higher educational attainment, especially for women, and more robust membership in non-governmental associations. And this, this is what he said from his study. He says, these positive effects only apply when dealing with what he calls conversionary Protestants, which was a term he made up. But he was trying to say it only happens where Christians are preaching that you are converted, you're changed because of faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, even though these missionaries were opposed to opium addiction and slavery and land confiscation, he said they were not political activists. And yet, by and large, these nations were renovated. And he said, it seems like this reform came in through the back door. That's what he said. Like they weren't aiming at these beautiful renovations of society. They were just aiming at human hearts and this happened accidentally. And I would say, no, no. God renovates the hearts of individuals and society changes as a result. That's the way it's meant to work. Does it always work that way? No. Do you have people who say they've put their faith in Christ and you never see it work out in their life? Yes, and the Bible does not condone that. We are meant to be renovated inside and it leads to reconciliation outside. That's why I've quoted so many times this article from the atheist Matthew Paris that he posted in the Times where he entitled it as an atheist, I truly believe Africa needs God. And he went to his home country in Africa and he saw this wonderful uplifting of the people as they were bringing clean water. And then he said, as a confirmed atheist, I've become convinced of the enormous contribution, not just that Christians, but Christian evangelism makes in Africa. He says, in Africa, Christianity is changing people's hearts. It brings a spiritual transformation. The rebirth is real and the change is good. And he said, I used to try to say, well, if your faith wants to lead you to help people, that's your business. And he says, no, but the, the faith itself is changing people. Here's someone who's saying, I don't want to believe this is true. And he says, and yet I saw a change in these people. Why? He said, because they were influenced by the conception of humanity's place in the universe that Christianity taught them. Christianity taught them you're broken because of sin, but beautiful in the image of God. And the son of God has renovated you on the inside. And so now you care for everyone made in his image that they might know him too. It's an internal change that leads to external change. It's an internal renovation that leads to external reconciliation. And if that pathway isn't happening, something's gone wrong. 
So you go, well, Ben, how come in the 18th and 19th century did people in the name of Jesus perpetrate slavery? Well, let me just say, we don't have time to do this, but all through church history, you see Christians opposing the practice of slavery. Bartolome de las Casas showed up in the 1500s in the Caribbean. And he looked and he saw the enslaving of natives and said, this is wrong. They're made in the image of God. We should be bringing them the gospel, not enslaving them. And he condemned it. As he saw Africans come over, he was told these were war criminals. And he thought, well, I guess that's okay. And for decades, that perpetrated until he found out he was being lied to. And he realized, no, this whole institution should be stopped and shut down. That was in the 1500s. And then you saw men like Lay and Edmondson and all through history, people begin to push against it, both in the Caribbean and in Pennsylvania and all different places. Christians rising up to saying this institution is against the heart of God. And the abolitionist movement of ending slavery, both secular and Christian historians say it came out of the roots of the gospel of human beings are made in the image of God and are meant to be treated with dignity. And where that is being opposed, it should be opposed. And so you see men like John Newton that was a slave trader. When the gospel changes his heart, he became an abolitionist. And I will tear this system apart. And in the nations where slavery unraveled, it's because the Christian pushed to see society change because God had changed them from the inside out. Does that make sense? There's much more you can say, but that's the idea. So now, I know I'm going over, but let me show you how Paul is doing this to Philemon. He just sent his bondservant this guy had entered into this situation with you and then he fled, there's a breach. But notice how Paul argues in verse 17. If you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Paul says, do you consider me part of your koinonia? The word he used earlier. Am I part of your fellowship? Am I part of your community? Then I'm putting my arm around this man and when you see him, I want you to see me. I want you to see family. I want you to see brother. And that's why he said brother in the flesh and the Lord. Not just brother because you both believe in Christ. Brother because I led you both to Christ. We're a family. And he grabs them both and says, God has done something different in your relationship. And if I'm your partner, he is too. And then Paul understands that Philemon is probably gonna feel the tension of the financial loss associated with that. We had entered this bond agreement and he violated the bond. I'm out some money or maybe he stole money. I don't know. There's a financial incentive to this that clearly could potentially be a problem for Philemon. And Paul anticipates this. So in verse 18, Paul says, and if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. He says, this is no longer your bond servant. This is your brother. If I'm your family, he's your family. And if he owes you anything, charge it to me. The book of Philemon is fascinating in the sense that it's, it's the only book in the New Testament that doesn't preach the gospel. And it doesn't preach it because Paul is showing it. Do you see what he's doing? All of his debt put on me. And all of my love put on him. Do you see it? It's the great exchange we have in the gospel. All of our debt because of sin went on to Christ and all the love from the Father for Jesus lands on us in the beloved. Paul doesn't preach the gospel, he displays it. If it works here in the book, it's gotta work here in real life. And so he's showing the Colossian church, Philemon, Onesimus, this has to change. I'm not sending him back because I have to and I can tell you what to do, but I need you to understand this. This internal renovation has external implication and I need you to for not, just forgive him, but to love him and call him brother. And if there's any financial issues with that, you pin that on me. And then Paul makes this letter a promissory note. In verse 19, he says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Why does he say he wrote it with his old hand, own hand? Paul didn't normally write letters. He used an amanuensis. Paul would walk around and talk and someone else would write it down. You get it like at the end of the book of Romans. The amanuensis is like, hey guys, what's up? It's me. And so Paul, at a couple letters, will say at the end, I signed this with my own hand so you can see it. He didn't write them because Paul, you see in Galatians, had bad eyes. He had eyesight problems. So he told the Galatians at the end, see with what large hand letters I write with my hand. At the end, he signed it and he was like, man, I can't read this. Like, uh. And so Paul didn't usually write them. He had someone else do it. And yet here, Paul says, I will repay it. And then Paul grabs the piece of paper and signs it and says, make this a legally binding document. If he owes you anything, you charge it to me. This debt is done. But then Paul says, to say nothing of you owing me even your own self. I don't want to bring it up, but technically you owe me everything. 
because he's the one who led him to Christ. Your eternal future is because of my choice to take the hit for the sake of the gospel. But you make the call. I don't want to bring it up. I just didn't want to mention it, but you know, he mentions it. And in case it's getting missed in verse 20, yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Yeah, I'm saying what you think I'm saying. I'm saying his debt is done. And I'm saying I'm willing to pay for it, but you owe me your life. So yeah, you're kind of picking up on what I'm doing. You wipe out the financials. You take the hit for the sake of the gospel. You refreshed others' hearts in your little koinonia. But just loving your friends doesn't change the world. I want you to love those who hurt you too. I'm pushing the boundaries of your love, Philemon. I want it to extend out. And so, yes, I'm saying what you think I'm saying. Forgive the unforgivable. Love the unlovable. You embrace him as family. The social structure changes because of the implications of the gospel. And so do it for my sake. Refresh my heart. And then he signs off in verse 21. I love it. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, Knowing you will do even more than I say. What's the even more? We don't know. Probably send him back after he deposited the letter. We good? We good? All right. I'm heading back to help Paul. But in case he doesn't, verse 22, at the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers, I'll be graciously given to you. I love that Paul's real enough to be like, hey, I want you to do this, but go ahead and get a room ready because I'm going to show up to make sure this all went down. Okay? (laughs) Okay. Just to be clear, a little built-in accountability. And that's why at the end, he says, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you, plural, y'all. Hey, y'all all see that this goes down. That we're not just gonna preach the radical, inexhaustible love and reconciliation of Jesus from Colossians and then not live it out in our real relationships. So Paul preaches Colossians and then he shows them Philemon and Onesimus and says, we gotta see it play out here. Now, let me close with this. Why is this letter in here? Why is this personal correspondence a part of our Bible throughout the centuries? According to church history, Onesimus became the bishop of Ephesus, leader of one of the most influential cities in the church. So a lot of scholars believe Onesimus is the one who preserved this letter because it was the charter of his freedom. Because by preserving it, he showed the world, this is the implications of the gospel. It wasn't a revolution against Rome. That's why Jesus refused. When they tried to make him king, he said, no, I'm not leading an insurrection against Rome. I'm leading a renovation that will sweep through nations, throughout histories, that will change nations. Yes, it has political implications now, but I want it to have implications throughout the nations, throughout eternity. It's an internal movement with external implications. It's a renovation that leads to reconciliation, and you must have both. We must see it but it starts in here, that this letter of liberty was a testimony to how the gospel renovates relationships back then and breaks these social structures. And it's also the challenge to us to do the same. So let me just close with two questions and thank you for letting me go over. Number one is what activity in your life is the direct outworking of the gospel in your life? Can you identify a single activity you do now that is a direct result of the gospel working in your life? But if you wake up, get coffee, get dressed, go to work, watch entertainment, check your phone, see some friends, check your phone, head to the bar, check your phone, get in bed, check your phone, go to sleep, and you look just like everyone else that doesn't know Christ, what's going on here? The renovation is meant to lead to reconciliation. It's meant to refresh hearts because he's renovated mine. What is happening in your life that's a direct result of the gospel working inside of you? Paul says, I became a prisoner. Archippus became a fellow soldier, one that maybe needs a kick in the pants, but he's a fellow soldier. Philemon, you had the church meeting in your house. Some of you, there's some changes that need to happen to your schedule, to where you use your energy, to where you use your time, and where to use your money. And that's the last thing. It's not even a question. I'm just telling you this last one. If the gospel doesn't touch your resentments or your wallet, you're playing games. And that's what Paul tells Philemon. 
this gospel has to work on your resentments. Forgive him because the Lord in Christ forgave you. So he told all the Colossians and I'm sure they nodded along. So good, so good. Okay, forgive him. No, no, yes, yes. You don't grip Christ and grip resentment at the same time. Now I'm not minimizing that we've been hurt or that we will hurt each other, but we have a supernatural power with which to deal with it. And so Paul unashamedly takes these men and says the church needs to see you. Not just say, don't worry about it, but be family. Is there someone you need to forgive? Is there resentment you need to release because you trust the sovereign God over your story and the grace of Jesus to comfort you? If the gospel's not touching your resentments, that's a problem. Now, it may be a process, but it's meant to change you. And if it's not touching your wallet, then how is the gospel impacting your life? And hey, look, this isn't a giving talk where I'm trying to get a bunch of money. I'm not buying a new watch. I'm fine with this one. This isn't me trying to get a bunch of money from you. This is me telling you. Paul looked at Philemon and said, if the gospel's changed your life, it should change your financials. Forgive that man. Take the hit because of him. And for you, if you're in Christ, but the gospel hasn't made you a servant in the church, hasn't made you a servant of the community you live in, hasn't led you to leverage your finances, let me tell you something. Slavery is as alive and well in the human story today as it's ever been. Do you know that? And so we can look at them back then and say, how did all these people not care about it in the 18th, 19th century? Well, some of them, it was sin. I mean, they just ignored the Bible and did it anyway. Others of them, it was indifference. I'm not around it. I'm not in a part of the world where it's around me, so I don't deal with it. And we can judge them for that, and they were wrong for that. But let me be honest with you. If you do a little digging on your sneakers or your cell phone or some of the things in your apartment, you might realize I'm a little more connected to the problem than I'm comfortable with. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? As long as I have breath, how is my life going to be used to relieve human suffering in the world? And by the grace of God, enough momentum started in Christian history of people believing, no, we can actually change things. This institution, though it's historic, doesn't need to be perpetuated in the future. And you saw Christians begin to coalesce around the implications of the freedom in here becomes freedom out there. And you saw society change by the people who've been changed by God. And it's meant to be the same with us. Don't look at the sin of the world and say, what can one woman or one man do? Look at how God has changed your heart and say, but what could we do if I offer God my hands, if I offer him my mouth, if I offer him my money, that yeah, I'm gonna buy clothes, buy entertainment, have fun with my friends, but I'm gonna make sure a significant part of what I make goes to love those who Christ loves. That's how we're meant to live. That you can look at your life and say, I'm a prisoner. I'm a fellow soldier. I'm a fellow worker. The boundaries of my koinonia keep extending out. The renovation from within leads to a reconciliation without. And the world begins to see people who take their faith seriously. And when they see us take it seriously, they'll take it seriously. And societies begin to change. And the gospel advances because God renovates from the inside out.